focus on headline. All right, let's take a look at what major issues are making the headlines here on Focus on Headline. For this, joining us in the studio today, we have our reporters in Yoon Se-young and Lee Aran. Guys, welcome back. Good evening. Good evening to you guys. Uh, we're going to start things off with the very first meeting of the South Korea-U.S. Nuclear Consultative Group. Uh, this was held at the presidential office in Yongsan on this Tuesday morning. Remember, this is one of the outcomes of the uh, the uh, Washington, Washington summit, that's mm-hmm. right, uh, that took place uh, earlier this year. We had the Washington Declaration, which emphasized, of course, the nuclear deterrence uh, between the two allies. Uh, President Yoon uh, stopped by, delivered a message to encourage the first session of the NCG. Uh, so you're going to start us off on this. Uh, what's the latest? Sure. NCG is a bilateral nuclear consultative group between Seoul and Washington that aims to curb nuclear threat from North Korea. Back in April, like you said, SJ, when President Yoon song yeol visited Washington, Presidents Yoon and Biden agreed to launch such nuclear consulting group to strengthen extended deterrence and manage the North Korean nuclear threat, reassuring Washington's pledges to temporarily deploy more nuclear-capable assets to Seoul, while Seoul reaffirmed its non proliferation obligations under the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. The consultative group is set to have a meeting every quarter and report the results of the meeting to the presidents of South Korea and the U.S. And President Yoon song yeol also stopped by the meeting room this morning before attending the cabinet meeting to encourage the South Korea-U.S. delegation and their first meeting. Yoon asked for actual efforts to prevent North Korea from uh, using the de- developing nuclear weapons and to build a strong and effective Seoul-Washington extended deterrence. And the first session of the meeting was led by the first deputy director of the National Security Office, Kim Tae-ho, and the U.S. National Security Council's Indo-Pacific Affairs, Kurt Campbell. It was also joined by defense and foreign officials from the two countries. And during the joint press briefing held this afternoon after the inaugural meeting of NCG, Seoul's deputy national security advisor Kim Tae-yo said the first meeting focused on creating a secure dialogue channel and how to operate Washington's nuclear assets with Seoul's non-nuclear assets together. And both Kim and Campbell also stressed that any nuclear attack by the North against the South will be met with a swift, overwhelming and decisive response, resulting in the end of Kim Jong-un regime. So we've seen a number of meetings happen uh, prior to the NCG and, of course, in other uh, meetings where we ha- even have, uh, I believe, uh, from the Japanese sides get involved with the talks. However, unfortunately, what we've seen, seen so far is lack of sort of a dialogue from North Korea. And uh, despite all these talks of uh, nuclear deterrence and so forth, it only led to uh, North Korea's further provocation and so forth and so there is still very much high hopes on this very uh the the nuclear consultative group in hopes that this really were will uh, eventually bring north korea back to the negotiating table so with that much expectations i mean what can we expect from the ncg meeting today being that it was the very first of its kind uh, and also what is the u.s aiming to achieve uh through the very first meeting Aran, you're going to tell us about how the u.s saw the uh, first meeting there sure uh, a s- spokesperson from uh, from the White House National Security Council said in a written interview on Monday before the first NCG meeting is held that the inaugural NCG meeting would be an opportunity to reaffirm the U.S.'s commitment to provide extended deterrence to South Korea backed by the full, full range of U.S. capabilities, including nuclear. According to the NSC, the newly established nuclear consultative group between South Korea and the United States focuses on managing the threat posed by the DPRK, specifically how the bilateral alliance deliberates on consults within and plans uh, for the worst case circumstances of a DPRK strategic attack. The NSC also emphasized that the actions taken by uh, the U.S. ROK alliance in implementing the Washington Declaration and through the NSG and NCG are a prudent response to the DPRK's escalatory and dangerous behavior and further the alliance's goal of promoting peace and stability in the region. Amid continuing provocations by North Korea, The NSC spokesperson said that the DPRK's continuing efforts to advance its unlawful nuclear and ballistic missile capabilities 
greatly undermined regional security and stability. He stressed that unlike the DPRK's actions, U.S. ROK efforts to improve their defense posture and protect their citizens from DPRK threats to use nuclear weapons are not in violation of U.N. Security Council resolutions. The spokesperson went on to say that the U United States and R Republic of Korea remain open to dialogue with the DPRK without preconditions, as demonstrated by multiple offers to meet from senior U.S. and ROK officials. Meanwhile, North Korea test-fired a Hwasong-18 solid fuel intercontinental ballistic missile last week under the guidance of leader Kim Jong-un, despite international condemnation over its recent missile launches. Again, I mean, we've talked about this on a number of cases, and uh, it's almost like a broken record, but uh, the message that we're getting from Washington, and I believe uh, the U.S. State Department also uh, set this uh, on Monday as well. I believe it was a with an, through an email through uh, Yonat News Agency, I believe, that they're open to hold any kind of discussions. It's any topic is what they said, basically. We could talk about anything. I don't know whether it be the weather or something like that. But again, any topic, they're willing to talk. But of course... The big thing here is North Korea does not want to talk, right? The North mm -hmm. Korea, the only thing that North, the only thing that North Korea is going to like to hear from uh, the United States is no comments about or any kind of comments in regards to we would like to hold talks without any precondition. They want to hear, okay, listen, we'll have some sanctions uh, lifting first, and let's have talks here. That's the only thing that's going to trigger North Korea at this time. And so the big question being all these talks about nuclear deterrence and all these uh, discussions, other discussions, is this going to further push away North Korea is the big question here. But hopefully, though, eventually, and the sad fact about all this is that if you look at uh, the past trends of how North Korea was brought back to the negotiating table, it wasn't necessarily that, uh, you know, either Washington or Seoul basically said, listen, this is the offer that we have. It kind of followed them testing their nuclear weapons and going, all right, we're, we're capable of using nuclear weapons. This is our leverage. Let's talk now. And uh, so the consensus right now is that basically, unless North Korea ends up, you know, conducting their seventh nuclear test, they're going to use that leverage and go, all right, we're ready to talk. What do you have for us now? Because we are fully capable of using this nuclear weapon, and you're going to eventually declare us to be a nuclear state, which is what North Korea wants. So it, it's it's very difficult right now to, especially in this current situation where uh, there is no, how, how do you say, you know, you, when you want to kind of bring a dog to come at you, you want to kind of feed them a little snack here. Treat. Uh, there's treat. Uh, the, North Korea is not getting any treats right now hence they're not coming back uh mm. but nevertheless uh, where we still have hopes high that uh you know eventually eventually uh we'll have the three sides get involved with talks once again like they did uh before the hanoi no deal uh we're gonna move on here the u.s government also welcoming president yun sager's visit to ukraine on saturday we've talked about how the u.s has been keen on south korea's uh, involvement with the war in ukraine uh, i don't you have more on this as well that's right, SJ. A spokesperson from the U.S. State Department said Monday that the United States welcomes President Yoon Song yars recent trip to Ukraine, calling on other uh, all other countries to join in supporting the war-torn country. Yoon made a surprise trip to Ukraine on Saturday, during which he met with Ukrainian President Zelensky and promised to provide a comprehensive package of security, humanitarian, and reconstruction assistance. In a press briefing, State Department Press Secretary Matthew Miller said that the U.S. government thinks that it is important for foreign leaders to make a trip to Ukraine to speak firsthand with President Zelensky to see the discussion this construct the uh, destruction uh, that has been inflicted on that country by Russia. Let's move on here. We have the four ministers of the ASEAN Regional Forum that have criticized North Korea's continued ballistic missile launches as a threat to regional peace, and it also supported uh, the international community's efforts to complete verifiable and irreversible denuclearization, or CVID. This is, of course, a terminology uh, that we've uh, said oh so much some years ago. Uh, Seung, tell us about the statement released by the top ASEAN diplomats. Sure. Um, the statement came from the ASEAN Regional Forum, or ARF that took place in Indonesia from last Thursday to Friday. 
Forty ministers who attended this year's ARF expressed strong concern over North Korea's growing nuclear threats and stressed the importance of peaceful dialogue. They also urged all parties involved to continue to make efforts to realize permanent peace and stability on the Korean Peninsula and urged international efforts to achieve complete, verifiable and irreversible denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula in a peaceful manner. If you remember, the term CVID of North Korea was accepted by Park Geun-hye and Obama administrations, but was avoided during the previous Moon administration that put much emphasis on peace initiative by encouraging Pyongyang to actively participate in the peace process. But amid strained relations between the two Koreas, the term CVID is again being used by the international community as the only way to achieve regional peace. And the statement released after ARF meeting um, at the same time explained that at the meeting, various views were shared on the root cause of the tension on the Korean Peninsula and said that diplomatic efforts, including creating an environment that helps peaceful dialogue between all parties involved, should be considered as a priority. And the ARF that was formed in 1994 is the only regional multilateral security consultative body involving North Korea, meaning that for North Korea, it's a rare opportunity opportunity to have a diplomatic engagement with ASEAN top diplomats. But this year, North Korea sent the ambassador to Indonesia, An Gwang Il, to the forum instead of Foreign Minister Choi Son Yi. So North Korea, um, it seems like North Korea is not uh, willing to have a dialogue with the relative parties. Oh, no, they're, they're really not. Uh, mm. And, you know, it's interesting that the only time, well, I shouldn't say the only time in the history of this peace process, but uh, we saw it back in, uh, I believe, 2000 during the uh, the former uh, Kim Dae-jung uh, administration. But even then, right, like the sunshine, uh, it's the sunshine policy, right? That a lot of people were criticizing that, but it seemed like it worked at the time. Uh, obviously, uh, Kim Jong-un at the time kind of strayed away from that and then uh, tested his nuclear weapons and just kind of killed off everything. But North Korea is not a fan of the whole idea of complete, verifiable, uh, and irreversible denuclearization uh, of North Korea or denuclearization. Uh, or uh, Korean Peninsula, uh, but you have to sort of feed them something right now. Mm. And I think the only reason why uh, the Hanoi summit, again, did not pull through is because I don't think North Korea received any security guarantees. I think that's mm -hmm. what they wanted, right? And I keep, I'm going to, I'm going to say, say it again, John Bolton. I'm going to say John Bolton mm -hmm. again, what he said with the, uh, what was it? Uh, uh, the Libyan model is what he called mm. it, right? And uh, we know that uh, Gaddafi, Muammar Gaddafi back then, uh, when he was kind of, I guess he wasn't really given a guarantee, but they didn't denuclearize. As soon as that happened, I mean, he was kind of, uh, you know, ousted, but kind of killed off by his own people. It wasn't the U.S. government per se. But North Korea, the last thing they want to hear is a Libyan model. And that's mm. what Kim Jong-un is very much afraid of. And so that's the thing that killed it off. But again, there's two ways, I think, if you look at North Korea at this time, is either you feed them something, you give them something, dangle something, get back to the negotiating table, or completely ignore them is what it is. I think that was one of the things that I think uh, the South Korean government did once, or uh, even the Obama administration did once, would be completely ignore North Korea, and they started saying, all right, let's start talking once again, because they want to get the attention, uh, is what it is. Right. And it's I've always mentioned this comparison with dealing with North Korea. It's kind of like dealing with a, uh, a crying baby, is what it is. And unfortunately... We're unable to find any kind of solution at this time here. Uh, let's move on here. Uh, we have more updates on the unfortunate uh, tragedy that has been striking in parts of Korea due to the torrential rains. Uh, we talked about the Osong uh, underground roadway. Another body has been recovered overnight, uh, which brought the number of people dead or missing down to, uh, from the downpours to 50. We also have some updates, I believe, on uh, three more bodies that were recovered and unfortunately has been included in the death toll as well. Aran, uh, let's also get more on this. Sure. As of 6 a.m. today, the Central Disaster and Safety Countermeasure Headquarters announced that the number of casualties in recent downpours remains at 50, the, the same as the count at 11 p.m. yesterday. Nationwide, in the aftermath of the heavy rains that have pounded the country since since last week, 44 people have been reported to have been killed, including one body recovered last night from the underground roadway in Osong, Chungcheongbuk-do province. The authorities said that uh, the rescue operation concluded there with the recovery of the last missing person's body.
In relation to the five people reported missing in Yecheon, Gyeongsangbuk-do province, the search operation is still underway, and in total, six people remain missing na nationwide, including one from Bu Busan. Excuse me. This morning, another body was reported to have been found in Yecheon, but the identity of the deceased has not been confirmed yet, so it has not been counted in the government's official tally of casualties. The number of people dead or missing from the recent heavy rain is the highest since 2011 when the number was 78. Across the country, 12,709 people evacuated their homes due to rain damage. Among them, a total of 5,672 people have not been able to return to their homes. Downpours have also damaged 912 public facilities and 574 other private properties, mostly located in the southern part of the country. South Korea has an annual monsoon season, but this was its second consecutive year of significant flooding. And in August last year, 11 people died from serious flooding. Again, we mentioned that uh, despite uh what we saw last year, and especially uh, last year, Seoul was impacted very heavily, and it was just an right. overnight thing that, I mean, the rain that we haven't seen apparently in 115 years, and despite warnings, advance warnings, and call for preparations, there is a lot of people, there are a lot of people who are saying that, why weren't there further, I guess, measures put in place? And especially with the, the Ozong underpass, I think was what a lot of people are saying. There were reports coming out saying that an hour before, mm -hmm. uh, of course, the tragedy that struck over at the underpass, there were reports of a 119 call saying that they need to block that area. Uh, apparently, that hasn't, uh, that didn't happen. And fortunately, there have been a, a large number of people uh, who passed away because of that. And it really is unfortunate that we continue to look for changes after people die and such tragedies mm -hmm. continue to happen. So uh, we'll continue to keep a close tab on this. But uh, uh, in response to all this, uh, President Yoon suk uh said on Tuesday that all subsidies for what he called corrupted cartels uh, should be abol abolished and instead those money should be used for flood damage recovery and compensation. Uh, Seung, tell us more about the details on what he exactly said. Yeah, just we uh, we just uh, talked about heavy downpours caused major flooding and landslides across the nation, and there has been huge property damage, and unfortunately, many people lost their lives as well. And in response, President Yoon said at a cabinet meeting held in Yongsan earlier today, national taxpayers' money should be used to wipe away people's tears caused by disasters, emphasizing his strong will to completely abolish the subsidies for cartels uh, with vested interests. Trust. If you take a look at the political direction of President Yoon um, so far, he has declared war on certain group, taking a very strong firm stance against that group. Um, for example, he declared war on labor union, violence at construction sites, konpog, drugs, and so on. And mostly recently, Yoon ordered his cabinet members to ruthlessly fight cartels with vested interest, waging a campaign against so-called cartels within a certain professions in South Korea. And even while emphasizing the importance of speedy recovery from heavy rain, he did not forget to reaffirm his policy direction toward the cartel uh, within Korean society. He then went on to say that we need to fundamentally change the disaster management system and response method and stress that South Korea should prepare a new system to deal with unprecedented climate change and its consequences. Yoon also highlighted the importance of improving digital monitoring system for natural disaster. But you know, like you just mentioned, Australia, these measures were also mentioned when we faced massive damage from torrential downpours last year. And for that reason, many people are skeptical about what changes and improvements have been made for the past year and whether such efforts and measures have worked properly uh, to prepare for this year's heavy monsoon rainfall. Yeah, maybe uh, national taxpayers' money should be used to prevent people's, uh, I guess, tears from falling in the first place, right? Mm. And prevention is the very first step. And I keep mentioning right. that, unfortunately, we've seen cases with last year's uh, Itaewon crowd crush incident, how they're putting in stru stronger measures and stronger regulations and stricter laws here and there after uh, the incident took place. But, uh, you know, preventing it first, I think, is the most important thing at this time. And sure, use all the tax money uh, to prevent it happening. I don't think anyone's mm. going to complain this, especially because 
this is an annual occurrence right now. The monsoon season happens every single year. It's just that right. we're seeing nowadays the pattern is that the the rains are coming in stronger, which means that we need to be more you know more well prepared. Uh, and uh, it really is unfortunate that we put in all these measures after uh, the incidents have taken place. But uh, hopefully we will see some changes uh, on that front. Uh, while authorities are still figuring out the total damage caused by the recent heavy rains, uh, unfortunately, more rainfall is expected throughout the nation tonight and tomorrow as well. Let's get some weather updates uh, on this, uh, Aran. Sure. Uh, most regions in South Korea are seeing rain again today. The Seoul metropolitan area is expected to have some occasional rain only until until tonight, while other areas will likely continue to have precipitations until tomorrow afternoon. Some southern parts of the country and Jeju-do Island might experience continuous rainfall until tomorrow night after some drizzle for a short period in, uh, in tomorrow afternoon. Now, the North Pacific High is expanding its influence near the southeastern part of the country, supplying warm and humid air. Also, with a low pressure system approaching from Shanghai, China, more warm and humid air will be supplied. In the southeastern part of Seoul and neighboring southern Gyeonggi-do province, rain has mostly stopped now, but Gangwon-do, Chungcheong-do, and Jeolla-do province might have 30 to 60 millimeters of rain per hour until tonight, and Gyeongsang-do province will also have similar amounts until tomorrow morning. Jeju-do Island is expected to get 30 to 80 millimeters of rain per hour until tomorrow morning, and especially in its mountainous areas, rainfall could exceed up to 100 millimeters per hour. With the death toll rising from the recent downpour, safety measures for any further damage from upcoming rainfall is more important than ever. The Korea Meteorological Administration, KMA, warned that as there is high chance of additional disasters, residents in high-risk areas should be ready to evacuate or seek refuge based on the assessment of the situation. Yeah, and also it's, you know, it happens during the monsoon season, but it's really difficult to kind of predict the weather and how much rain is going to be uh, pouring down and so forth because it seems like it's changing. I've been looking at the weather, uh, especially because I have some work that needs to be done outdoors and uh, I've been following up on the whatever the KMA has said and like the weather changes uh, left and right. So the best thing you, you need to do is obviously try to get, you know, the, uh, the I guess the latest updates on this, whether it be uh, to television or radio and so forth. I think a lot of these days, a lot of people have been relying heavily on the radio uh, broadcast because they mm -hmm. have been giving out uh, some of the latest uh, information on the weather forecast. So I uh, hope this tr holds true for a lot of our uh, listeners here in Korea as well. Um, We've been talking about for the past few years now, actually, uh, if there's uh, in the three plus years that I've been hosting this program, some of the uh, items that we've talked about uh, every year. Uh, let's see, the, the release of the contaminated water from Fukushima is one of them, uh, North Korea, obviously, but also climate change is something that we've covered on the program for quite a bit. And we even went as far as to say it's not even climate change anymore, it's climate crisis. Mm -hmm. And because of this, the extreme weather phenomena that we're seeing is not only in Korea, but it's really happening all over the world uh, because you look at Greece and Spain, for instance, more than 5,000 people, including 1,200 children, uh, had to evacuate in some parts uh, due to wildfires caused by heat wave. Uh, I've also heard that there's massive heat wave in the United States as well. So, Hale, let's get the details on what's going on globally. Sure. While South Korea is severely damaged by heavy rain, heat waves are raging in southern Europe. Spain has been suffering from extreme heat for the past several days, and temperature in Seville, Spain, I hope I pronounced it correctly, Seville. is Seville, Seville, Spain, is expected to hit 44 degrees this week. And not only in Spain, but also the southern, southern Europe in general, the heat wave is forecasted to continue next week, bringing record high temperatures in May. Many regions. And over in Greece, more than 1,200 children who were enjoying summer camp had to evacuate on Monday local time after wildfires caused by continued heat wave broke out and the flames approached the children's camp. And what's concerning is that more wildfires are expected to follow as consequences of climate crisis. And um, a further experts warn that the extreme weather phenomena are becoming more frequent and more intense in many countries 
due to global warming. Meanwhile, California fire authorities are on high alert. Southern California is experiencing wildfires for five consecutive days. Um, Southern California is one of the places that has been hit by historic scorching heat. And according to the California Fire Department on Monday, four wildfires broke out in Riverside County over the weekend amid sweltering temperatures and the fire crews are still battling to contain the Revy Fire, the largest of the four wildfires, which burned down more than 7,900 acres. For now, evacuation orders for the Reche and Highland fires have been lifted, but visitors and residents are still highly recommended to take precautions as Southern California has been greatly suffered wildfires caused by extreme heat this year. And according to California Fire Department, over 3,030 wildfires have burned more than 10,400 acres across California so far this year. Yeah, I was uh, was talking to a buddy of mine in over in uh, Los Angeles, no, no, Sacramento, sorry, mm. and uh, I was like, "What's the weather like over there?" So, oh, it's not bad. It's forty degrees. It's not bad, <laughs> forty degrees. And I heard that it went as high as like forty three <laughs> degrees over mm-hmm. there, and it's just getting ridiculous. But the, the scary thing with some of the West Coast area is that not only is it really hot, but it's also very, very dry. dry. Yes. And uh, you know, the, California, that area is uh, notorious for its drought, mm. uh, which is why I believe there's still like regular. Uh, water regulations in place and these wildfires is a again a regularly occurring uh phenomena over in the west coast but unfortunately there's nothing much they can do about mm-hmm. it because it seems like the weather is completely out of whack here and again there's going to be a lot of people who say well climate change climate crisis it's all a myth but what scares me is we're getting used to this kind of news, like wildfires. Are you used to I'm, scorching I'm, heat? I'm still not so, familiar with. I'm still not used to this. Yeah, I have to say. I mean, it's just getting worse and worse, <laughs> right? And then that's the thing. But. At the same time, you make a very good point in that I think some people are getting used to this mm-hmm. and not considering this a, a, a crisis. And they're right. saying, well, it's a normal occurrence, mm-hmm. right? And it should, No, it's not a normal occurrence, what we're seeing right now. We've never seen uh, anything like this. Exactly. And I think it was like, you know, a couple of years back was like the red flag because I think South Korea experienced one of the longest monsoon seasons mm-hmm. ever, right? It was something like, right. it was like 90 days or something like that. Was, what was it? How many days was 80 something days, I believe. And uh, it's... If, if that's not weird, I mean, I don't know what is. Uh, Nian T says you could probably fry an egg in 40 degrees. It's true. I mean, you've seen mm-hmm. that, right? You put it on the hood, uh, crack an egg on the hood of a car, and then it's going to start cooking is what you're seeing, unfortunately. Uh, let's move on to the economy because uh, extreme weather, it also takes a toll, obviously, on the crop harvesting. And uh, this is leading to an increase in food prices. Uh, Adam, let's talk about it. Uh, the weather and the climate crisis and how that impacts the economy as well. Sure. With the recent heavy rains causing damages to domestic agriculture industry, consumer price that has been stabilized lately is likely to be rebounding again. And this could lead to an increase in the price of dining out, causing financial burden on people. Some even concerned that the recent rise in food prices would mean the revival of the situation in 2020 when the agricultural sector suffered a lot from heavy rain and typhoons. According to Korea Agrofisheries and Food Trade Corporation on Monday, the wholesale price of uh, 4 kilograms of spinach reached 54,780 Korean won, or $43, showing a 219% increase from a month earlier. The wholesale price of red leaf lettuce rose by approximately 194% to 57,040 Korean won, or 45 US dollars. Cucumber price also increased by 53.4% to 62,325 Korean won, or $49 per 100 cucumbers. Experts say that the prices of agricultural pr- produce have been steeply on the rise due to uh, blistering heat, and the recent heavy rain has added fuel to the fire. Also, according to the Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs, the area of farmland effect- affected by flooding and landslide in recent days is approximately 27,094 hectares or 270 square kilometers, which is about 93.5 times the size of Yeoido Island, the center of Seoul. 
The damages to facilities such as livestock farms and greenhouses amounted to 19.3 hectares or 193,000 square meters, and the number of livestock casualties reached five. Uh, 579,000. And the damage on crops will further increase as the heavy rainfall is likely to continue for some time in the future. I remember when I was a struggling broadcaster, I used to uh, buy cucumbers and just eat cucumbers to fill me up. Probably would have not have been able to afford it uh, if that was <laughs> now. Uh, it, that's how ridiculous the prices are getting. And now there's further concerns right now because we have the Black Sea Grain Agreement, uh, which guaranteed Ukrainian grain exports to the Black Seas. I believe they used a three different ports in uh, the Black Sea, including uh, the port in Odessa. That expired as of midnight Monday because Russia uh, refused to extend the deal. This is probably going to cause a uh, further hike in grain prices as well. So, uh, let's get more on that. The Black Sea Grain Agreement that allowed the Black Sea export of Ukraine's grain for the past year are not valid anymore as Russia quits to renew the deal. It is now expected to bring negative impact on global food market as the deal was essential to keeping global food prices stable. So far, Ukraine has exported about 33 million tons of grain to the world, even during the war, through the Black Sea Grains Agreement. Ukraine and Russia signed the Black Sea Grain Agreement in July last year through the mediation of the United Nations and Turkey, and it has been extended three times so far. But Russia's refusal to extend the, um, the deal was announced shortly after the Crimea breach, uh, which connects Crimea and mainland Russia, was attacked. And after the attack, traffic on the Crimea bridge was immediately suspended, and Russian President Vladimir Putin responded with a very strong stance, defining it as terrorism by a Ukraine agency and vowing to retaliate. And the recent incident appears to be the biggest reason for refusing to extend the Black Sea Grain Agreement, but Russia insists that the attack on the Crimea bridge has nothing to do with Russia walking away from the agreement. Again, with the expiration of the Black Sea Grain Agreement, concerns related to food security have also been raised again. So far, thanks to the agreement, countries such as China and Turkey, as well as countries that suffer from extreme food insecurities such as Afghanistan and Sudan, have benefited as global grain prices have subsided. But uh, with possibilities of major increase in food prices in the near future, such countries may experience food shortages again. I believe uh, some of the African nations which have been suffering from massive droughts have been uh, relying heavily on the grain ex uh, imports uh, mm -hmm. from uh, Ukraine. And unfortunately, those are going to be the countries that are going to be affected by this. But I believe uh, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky basically came out uh, saying that you know, we had this deal in place with Turkey and the UN, and so it's still in effect. And so he's kind of hinting that they're still going to try to export these grains uh, through the Black Sea, despite the fact that Russia uh, is probably going to blockade uh, the ports there. So it's going to get uh, quite interesting. Hopefully, but they'll Russia be able to... responded that um, it can't not guarantee the safety. Oh, of, of the course not. Oh, no, 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 absolutely, <laughs> because they, they pulled. I, I can't say they pulled out, but they mm. didn't renew. It, right and according to them those ports you know belong to them which is why they continue to try to take the, the eastern ukraine areas and a lot has to do with the fact that there's a lot of resources and all the ports are located in the eastern ukraine is what we're seeing here uh rounding things out here we have south korea filing a cancellation suit against the permanent court of arbitrations uh in order to uh, the order to pay over 50 million u.s dollars to a u.s based hedge fund elliot uh, it's been 28 days since the verdict was made now uh, Adam, explain to us uh, South Korea's grounds for the litigation there. Sure. According to the Ministry of Justice, South Korea has initiated revocation litigation, litigation against an order to pay a hedge fund named Elliott more than $50 million in damages over the controversial merger of two Samsung affiliates in 2015. Elliott sued the South Korean government in 2018 after losing a proxy fight opposing the merger between Jail Industries and Samsung CNT. The American investor, which was then CNT's second largest shareholder, had argued that the merger undervalued CNT's share price, causing unacceptable cost to its shareholders. However, the deal went through after South Korea's state-run National Pension Service, NPS, approved it with a greater CNT stake than Elliott. 
So uh, the International Center for Settlement of Investment Dispute last month ordered the South Korean government to pay $53.6 million, which is around 7% of what Elliot originally claimed. And South Korea said that the country had to pay a total of around 103 million U.S. dollars or 130 billion Korean won, considering legal fees and interest and damages. And today, the Ministry of Justice issued a statement to announce uh, the revocation lawsuit, saying that uh, based on the general principle of commercial law, minority shareholders do not bear any responsibility to other minority shareholders for exercising their voting rights. It added that it's difficult to find any investor state dispute settlement case where the state is held liable for damages in cases where public institutions participated in shareholders' meetings as minority shareholders and exercised their voting rights. To give you a context, Elliott had claimed that the merger of the two Samsung affiliates was merely a tool to help smooth transition of power to Lee Jae-yong, a scion of Samsung, Samsung's founding family. Also, a corruption scandal in 2016 subsequently revealed that the NPS sided with Samsung as it was pressured, it was pe- pressured by the presidential office headed by then-president Park Geun-hye, who was later impeached. Of course, uh, this is uh, an incident and a case that we've been following closely up on, and it seems like it's still not uh, done and over with uh, just yet. And so, again, this is another issue that we'll keep a close tab on uh, on the matter. And, of course, uh, update all of our listeners on it as well. Guys, uh, thank you very much for your reports today. Uh, Stay safe, and we'll see you guys again. Thank you. You can listen to Korea Now with me, SJ Lee, by downloading the Arirang Radio application or tune in online by visiting www.arirangradio.com. So make sure you tune in Mondays through Fridays, 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Korea time.